What's up, everybody? Welcome back. We appreciate you joining us here on a beautiful, beautiful North Carolina Sunday evening as we record this, as always, on the Inside Carolina Network of Podcasts. This is the Coast to Coast. I'm your host, Joey Powell. Sherelle McMillan, Sean Moran join me as usual, and we appreciate you guys taking some time out of your lives to download and listen to what we got to say, talking about basketball, recruiting, and all of that stuff that goes into the UNC basketball stew. Uh, if you have not, take a second to rate and review us, please. We appreciate that. It goes a long way with regard to uh, getting this podcast and all of us, these podcasts up in the algorithms so that when people search for us, they find us, which means more people listen to us, which means more ad revenue, which means better content, which means everybody wins. Take a second, rate, review us. Uh, if you don't like what we're doing, give us a heads up too. We don't want to put crap out there, right? So... Uh, we appreciate you guys who have given us ratings and reviews. If you wouldn't mind, if you haven't done one of those and you've thought about it, just take a second. I would really appreciate it. Uh, and if you don't, Sherelle's daughters will cry. Um, with that said, uh, we appreciate you guys joining us. Thanks to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring. We'll get into mentioning them in a little bit, but uh, make sure you subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the Inside Carolina channel there. Uh, and make sure if you're not a premium subscriber to Inside Carolina, Whoo, dog, after these past four weeks, you are missing all of the goodness. Um, basically, if you were Inside Carolina Premium subscriber, you have kind of been a de facto uh, co-roommate of Sherelle McMillan because the man has lived on the site for the past four weeks, just giving you guys goodness. And Sean Moran is not far behind with all of the new offers and new scouting reports that he's had to put up. And guys, why don't we just go ahead and get into it? Uh, I think the first thing that folks are probably going to want to hear about is a new offer, and they've been coming hot and heavy from the transfer portal. But also, this is just a brand new class of 22 high school recruit. And if you listen to this podcast regularly, you'll know here on the Coast to Coast that we have talked about this young man before. And I remember him because he's from freaking Nebraska, Grand Island, Nebraska, to uh, to refresh your memories. 6'9 forward from the class of 22, Isaac Trout. I'm going to start with Sean. Sean, tell everybody what we remember about Isaac Trout's game. Uh, again, 6'9", 205, 210, somewhere around there. Traditional power forward type, but let everybody know what they can expect to see from his game and how he might fit into uh, what we think Hubert Davis and his staff are going to deploy as far as an offense goes. Yeah, so this is uh, really Hubert's first, uh, first high school offer, um, and I know UNC had been looking at him uh, kind of in the, in the winter time, uh, didn't offer uh, when they when they were, but here we are in the spring. Uh, so what you're going to see is is really a a stretch four. Uh, Trout is a guy that is comfortable in the post. He can score in the post, but he he can he can also move um, and he can also shoot. He shot 37 percent from the three point line uh, as a junior. Uh, he's got you know good shot mechanics, but you also notice at times during his high school season, he'd bring the ball up the court um, and basically played de facto point guard. Uh, so he does have some ball handling ability. I think in his high school league, uh, you know, you'd see them running double team, triple team, create, you know, crazy defenses at him just because he was so much bigger uh, than the players he was playing against. But he's very skilled. Uh, I think athletically, he's not going to blow anybody away, you know, with you know, his explosiveness, but at the same time, I'd, I'd probably give him, you know, average on athletic ability, but he does have some length, which makes up for it. So, you know, he can catch the ball at the three-point line and he can attack off the dribble. Uh, so I think for him, he is a true modern day, modern day four, where he's not, he's not, he's not going to spend all his time at the perimeter. Like I think you see a lot of players, but as I said, he's comfortable in the post, but he's got a good shot out to three and he can attack off the dribble when needed. So He's definitely an interesting player that has gotten a lot better over the last year. Uh, I think there's a, a ton of Big Ten, Big 12, some ACC schools that have, you know, paid him a lot of attention the last few months. Uh, so we'll see where UNC kind of slots in there. But once again, he's a very skilled and talented player that Hubert, uh, Hubert offered. And it would seem, uh, based on the write-up that Sherelle put on Inside Carolina, that uh, Coach Brad Frederick is actually the lead angler going after trout here um see what i did there uh sherelle um do you want to give anybody some ideas on what it might take to get him in the boat or how his recruiting uh process has gone thus far 
Yeah, it's been uh, uneven from a Carolina standpoint. I think they were, as Sean said, they were trying to decide exactly what they wanted in the class of 2022. And they really had no idea until the season was you know, ended um, with everything we were talking about, whether or not they were going to have to fill multiple holes at uh, in the post or you know, kind of at the four spot. Uh, and then since Hubert Davis has taken over, what we've seen is an offer to Christian Bishop from the mid- Midwest, who uh, kind of wants to do more of the stretch four thing. Uh, a commitment from Brady Manick, who is a stretch four from the Midwest, um, who that will be his role. We'll talk about him later. And now Isaac Trout, a stretch four from the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, really when I when we found out about the offer on Friday night, just a few hours after Manny's commitment, it kind of cemented what I th- we think Hebert Davis is going to do um, just in that everything he's done, everything he said publicly, uh, what we've heard privately always comes back to spacing and shooting. And I think Trout helps provide that if you're able to get him uh, because, you know, Manic is going to graduate and there's going to be kind of a spot to fill there, even though Justin McCoy has three years of eligibility, you know, he's just one guy. And mm-hmm. if you're going to play a system uh, that requires multiple shooters in order to create spacing, then you need multiple shooters. And uh, I think that's where, where Trout definitely comes in. And then I like him a lot, too, because some of these guys who are 6'9 and 6'10, they forget that. Um, and they stay and live on the three-point line. And if you watch some of his his film and his highlights, he remembers at times that he's 6'10", and he just goes into the paint and just, you know, throws up a hook shot over people. So that's one of the things I really like about him. And then Eric Bossy, uh, 24-7 Sports, his national recruiting director, is very, very high on him. He's seen him a few times. And when when Bossy talks, I, I generally listen. So um, it seems like a, a, a good offer for UNC. But again, the, the competition is going to be very, very stiff. Um, you know, with recruiting opening up on June 1st, uh, we'll see if he decides to visit Chapel Hill. That's a thing again, like guys <laughs> going to campus and visiting. Oh, yeah. We should have spent more time on that to open the show. That's actually <laughs> right, a great right. point. So we'll, we'll see if he makes the trip and, and how the kind of things go from there. And, it, you know, it does sound like this staff has actually started really fishing the same waters out in the Midwest. I mean, it's, it's it, between Trout and Manic, and, like you said, the Bishop offer. Uh, who knows what comes next? But um, let's hope that the Tar Heel staff can lure someone, if not a guy like Trout, uh, can, can bring someone like that to the boat. Um, so you mentioned uh, for a second, you mentioned uh, the Brady Manic commitment, and I want to spend some time with that. Uh, if you haven't, all of you listening right now, Sherell and Tommy did an emergency podcast right after his commitment on Friday evening. Uh, great insight. Talked a little bit about how that whole thing happened from a timeline standpoint. But what I'd like to do now is spend a little more time talking about his game. The beauty about Brady Manic is he's played four years with power five competition at a good program in Oklahoma. So he doesn't lack for film, but Sean, this is kind of your wheelhouse. You did a great write up on inside Carolina uh, on the premium message boards, kind of just doing a basic scouting report about Manic's game. I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit or go into some more of maybe the, the stuff that jumps out at you uh, on film that, that maybe you didn't put pen to paper on. Yeah, I mean, I think in all the articles, it's mentioned that he's hit uh, 235 threes on his career. So I think it's good to to start with that. And as you mentioned, he had he did play all four years at Oklahoma. Uh, he was actually a guy I got to see uh, a few games into his freshman year in person back when Trey Young was a freshman. And even at that point, he was he was starting. Uh, he was playing the four next to Kadeem Latin at the time. He was more of your you know, athletic shot blocking center, not a lot of skill offensively. And I remember, he, you know, even at that time he was draining, draining threes. And obviously that continued uh, throughout his career. And, you know, really when you look at him, he is a spot up shooter over 50% of his shots really each year come from the three point line, but he's got a very high, he's got a very quick release. Uh, so it doesn't, he doesn't need a lot of, a lot of time. And when you add that a big is guarding him, it makes it even easier when all you need is a little jab step to get some, to get some space. Um, you know, I think the main thing is he, his stats, uh, as well as his efficiency decreased from junior year to senior year. And I think there's a few reasons for that. So I would expect to see him really see him back at his junior year level. Um, you know, this past year he missed, uh, I think it was only two games, but he did miss two games because of COVID. Um, and then after that, there's also some injuries, he was dealing with. But third is 
uh, their, their main player, Austin Reeves, you know, really good player will probably end up getting drafted in the, in the second round, but he was a very ball dominant guard, six, five, uh, could handle the ball. And oftentimes with watching Oklahoma, he was handling the ball for 20, 25 seconds of the possession, operating in the pick and roll, pulling up, not really involving, even though he had a high assist percentage, not really involving uh, his teammates a lot, uh, I thought. So the, the Oklahoma of this year, I thought was a little bit different than in, in years past. So I think when you kind of combine those three, that it all makes for, for why his stats drop. But at the same time, he was still shooting at a very, very high level. Uh, but once again, beforehand, he was Big 12 honorable mention, uh, third team, all Big 12. And then this year, nothing. So I think uh, at Chapel Hill, he'll be able to get back to that junior junior year. But once again, you have the size and you have the shooting ability. Uh, is he going to, uh, you know, be, be the dominant shot blocker that uh, Sharp was? Definitely not, but he can, he can block off the, the help side and uh, he moves his feet well enough that he can, you know, he can switch and stay with, with players. But his main thing is shooting and, and that's what everybody at UNC has been, been clamoring for. So here's a very proven shooter coming to Chapel Hill after four years. And, you know, you mentioned that he came in with Trey Young and then with Reeves this past year to be able to average double figures with the volume of scoring that Trey Young did and then playing along who he's played against or who he's played with since then. Yeah, you know, it means the guy's probably do, doing his job fairly well. Um, all right, all right, all right. Shrill, I want to see if you wouldn't mind uh, speaking as to I, I think a lot of folks are assuming Manning's going to come in and start uh, with Justin McCoy's commitment recently. I do think he'll probably get a certain amount of minutes as well. But how do you think that that Manic plugs into the roster as it currently sits? You know, again, there's a lot of question factors about, you know, does Baycock come back? And we'll talk about we'll talk about the roster as a whole towards the end of the show. But how do you think Manic slots right now? Does he walk in and immediately get starters minutes? Yeah, I you know, I don't think there's promises given because that's just not how Carolina is going to do things uh, under Davis, just like they didn't do it under Roy Williams. But I think when you look at what they need and what they want and how it would complement Armando Baycott were he to come back, I don't see how, you know, Brady Manick comes to UNC um, and isn't the starter just because all of that experience. And then the biggest need on the team um, for UNC is shooting. And he adds that in spades. So I, you know, there's no way uh, I, unless he gets hurt or Justin McCoy becomes, you know, the greatest transfer of all time. I just don't see him not in the starting lineup. <laughs> um, and, you know, you, you think about uh, the potential North Carolina lineup, you know, you kind of assume you start talking about Kerwin Walton, he's, you know, back and uh, likely the starting to Caleb Love, likely the, the point guard again. And then you have Manic and then you have Baycott. That's four strong offensive players, assuming the normal, um, uh, advancement you know during the offseason the guys get better a wide array of skills too by the down. way yeah for sure very versatile um so yeah I, I think he's a he really is the perfect uh like he was the perfect transfer for unc at the moment because he their biggest need he uh addressed it sean i'm gonna ask i'm gonna ask you this question rel i'm gonna come back to ask you ask you the same thing <laughs> scale of one to ten how big of a splash is this it feels like a big deal am i am i overthinking things sean one to ten 10 being the biggest splash. Okay, uh, I'll go with an eight, which I think is is pretty high for me. Because uh, once again, I think it brings in shooting and it brings in a guy with experience. Um, I know, you know, Bishop, I think would have been interesting. Uh, and, you know, he would have been fun on, on the fast break. But I think with what he was looking to do, uh, you know, he wasn't at least, you know, once a lot can happen over the summer, but he wasn't offering that that shooting ability um, and, and here, but, but at the same time, he was offering, uh, uh, you know, the ability to switch for, you know, play more of a four, three almost, um, especially defensively. But once again, here, you're getting a guy that's coming in for one year, high level proven shooter. Uh, so at the same time, when you're recruiting big men, whether it's high school or the trans, you know, transfers next year, there's going to be immediate playing time because you can assume if Armando comes back, he'll most likely be gone. Uh, after after that year, and we know Brady Manning will be gone. So there's the open playing time as well. Uh, and once again, it fulfills a position position of need. So I, I think it's a it's an eight, Strong um, eight, but also something else. You know, when Hubert's made, you know, he offered McCoy, he offered Manic, he offered Bishop. 
I was kind of worried he was going to be throwing, just tossing out offers, but <laughs> really all three of the transfers, he, he's got two to commit. And the only reason, you know, Bishop didn't was Manic committed ahead of him. So they've been pretty focused so far. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that extends to the, the high school circuit, but overall it's a, it's a big splash and, and definitely will, will help them next year. Sherelle, one to 10. Uh, so I'll, I'll go Sean and, and say an eight. Um, actually I'll, I'll probably go nine. Um, it's, it's almost close to perfect. I mean, you just can't find, um, the thing that you need the most often in the portal and they did. And I think if you add him to McCoy, then I think it's a 10 because those are both positions of need. Um, they're both helping you tr to transition into a little bit of a different style of offense. We think, um, they're, they're key parts of that. And then, you know, when we talked about Hubert Davis, we said the two big things for, his staff and, and how he does things are identification and communication. And just looking at how everything worked out, they identified them very quickly, communicated very fast and got two commitments, you know, within his first eight days. So to me, that says that answers a question already. I'm not saying it's good. It's answered final, but that gives some insight into how he's going to do things because the two areas in recruiting that we said, okay, maybe they can work on this. They nailed, you know, with these two guys. And I want to make a point to, to shout out the folks on IC who are already panning Hubert Davis uh, within a week of landing the job because Walker Kessler did not come back. Um, I, I just I have no time for that. And I hope those folks will recognize that he specifically in 10 days identified two players from major programs that fit areas of just identified gaps in North Carolina's offense and got them to commit to come play for North Carolina without having, again, that's not perfect, but I don't know what you're expecting. Like it's, uh, you know, people wanted him to have the ghost of, of John Wooden and the corpse of Red Auerbach on his coaching staff. And if he didn't get that, they're going to be mad. People want to be, you know, if, if he doesn't bring in actual Larry Bird, not a guy that looks like Larry Bird, but actual Larry Bird and Julius Irving, uh, from the transfer portal, people are going to be mad. I, I'm glad you guys pointed out that this was an eight or a strong even nine, I think Sherelle said, because he's absolutely filled some gaps with two players who have experience at big-time programs, and I don't think you can ask for more from that from a young coach. Uh, with that said, I'm going to jump off my soapbox for a second and talk about our friends over at Johnny T-Shirt. Hey, look, it's Sunday as we're recording this. Uh, had a nice lunch in town on Franklin Street Friday, stopped over at a uh, nice little greasy spoon got me the two hot dog combo. Uh, it was amazing. It was good to be back in, inside. Uh, I'll go ahead and say it. Shout out to Sutton's Drugstore. Um, but uh, had a, a great lunch at Sutton's. And after that, you know what I did? I went to Johnny T-shirt. Went down to Johnny T-shirt, grabbed me a UNC a Nike uh, dry fit baseball shirt. Uh, I am like Sherelle. I am one that never has enough uh, Nike dry fit gear. And Johnny T-shirt's a place for it. Hit them up, johnnytshirt.com. If you don't want to shop in the store, they will bring it to your car. They'll do the curbside delivery, all that good stuff. Um, they do require a mask if you go in there. It's just because they're trying to protect you. And if you want to shop from the, the glorious luxury of your own home with your feet up on your recliner, or if you're sitting on the can using your phone, whatever you want to do, you can order from johnnytshirt.com, and they ship so quickly, it's almost like you're going to pick it up yourself. Johnny T-Shirt has all the gear from all the name brands you want for every single sport you can think of, uh, just university stuff, different sports, whatever. I mean, you know what? I even saw they have a really cool-looking dog leash. I don't have a dog, but, man, if I did, he would have that leash. UNC branded, nice little woven collar. I mean, it's pretty solid. Johnny T-Shirt, we love them. We hope you love them. Inside Carolina Premium subscribers, get the extra for 10% off the top. Make sure you use your code like I did, save your money off the top of what they're already saving you, get good gear. I don't know of a better equation for you. With that said, thanks to Johnny T-Shirt. Take a quick break. Let the national guys come in and run some advertisements, and we will be right back on the Coast to Coast. Thanks for sticking around on the Coast to Coast podcast here on the InsideCarolina.com network of podcasts. I'm Joey Powell. With me, as always, the two guys with the eyes – that are here to dramatize and not legalize the information that you seek about basketball recruiting, basketball playing, all of that, yada, yada, woo, woo, Cheryl McMillan, Sean Moran. All right, guys, we've talked about the two offer, the offer and the commitment. Let's talk about a guy that's been on UNC's radar for, uh, for quite some time in Deontay Green. 
And Sherelle, I think you had a chance to see him uh, at the Tournament of Champions recently. Talk a little bit about how Deontay Green might fit at UNC. Uh, right, Deontay Green. Um, <laughs> I hadn't seen him. I hadn't seen him uh, actually in person. Uh, so that was the first time. I watched lots of games and, and highlights and everything, but he didn't really come on to the Carolina radar until after uh, the coronavirus pandemic hit. So um, no opportunity to see him. And that was actually my first time in a gym watching basketball since uh, f- late January of 2020. So it was, it was strange. It was in between writing commitment articles and, <laughs> and scoops. You actually took some time to go sit in a gym and watch some guys. Play. Yeah, I've was... never seen anybody more dedicated <laughs> than you, but please carry on. It was weird, but it, w- it was cool to watch him because the team they were playing w- was clearly overmatched. I mean, CP, he plays for Team CP3, mm-hmm. which for those who don't know is on Nike's EYBL circuit. And CP3 always has a, a good team. They're, they're always pretty loaded. And this particular team um, has several high major guys, including Jaden Bradley, who has a, a, a Carolina offer. Um, but uh, so, yeah, the other team was overmatched. But what I was looking for, I wasn't keeping stats. I just wanted to see the basic stuff, how he moved his feet, um, how his hands were kind of where he set up the most, you know, is he in the high post or is he hanging around the perimeter? And how does he get up and down the court? If he dribbles, does it look halfway decent? How's it, you know, just all that basic stuff. And actually I, I came away um, with a better impression of him than I had from the film I watched. He looked more athletic in person than he did on some of the film and, and some of the games. And I think uh, for green, you know, at, at UNC, obviously, the stretch four is a big deal. <laughs> I think for him, the niche he can carve out is that um, he self-reported at 6'10", 205. Uh, so at 6'10", you know, I think you can play some center. You can you can be the small ball center. You can be the guy, not necessarily like a banger in the post or anything. And not a but, full-on rim protector uh, either, but yeah. Right, and, right, not a full-on rim protector, but somebody who can give you a presence in the paint. And I don't think – if he were to commit to UNC, I don't think they would ask him to do that for 30 minutes a game or be the full-time starting five, but having that versatility makes him more attractive to UNC because he can play, you know, that besides someone like Isaac Trout or besides someone like Justin McCoy. Now, I think the thing he needs to continue to prove on, and we talked to him about it after the game, um, is his rebounding. And he is cognizant of it. He's aware, and it's something that he is putting uh, – putting in work for lack of a better phrase uh, and improving on. And that's one of the reasons that he had the option to reclassify into 2021. One of the reasons he's not going to do that is because he feels like he needs more seasoning. He feels like he uh, can grow more um, as a high school player working out and everything than transferring or excuse me, than reclassifying into 21 and then kind of being stuck on the bench and not really being developed that way because he doesn't get an opportunity to play. Um, So all in all, you know, I, I think Hubert Davis will accept the mantra from Roy Williams about, you know, trying to get the top player in North Carolina every year if he's good enough to play at UNC. And I do think Deontay Green is, is good enough to play at UNC. And it sounds like that there hasn't been a lot of drop off between uh, between staffs as far as contact and interest. Is that fair to say? Yeah, his offer has been reaffirmed by Hubert, Dav- Hubert Davis. So um, it is not a situation where he kind of has like a lame duck offer. Right. Um, yeah, they're still recruiting him. I'm glad you shared that about his prescience and recognizing his own need to become a better rebounder. That's, that's really refreshing to hear from, um, from a kid of his age. So yeah, I just, you know, as I hate to try to sound like I'm 65 years old, but I swear it's, it's just really refreshing to hear somebody say that about, you know, knowing what they need to work on. Yeah. And I'll add to Joey, um, just talking to him and, and the family, um, there's definitely, uh, it's going to sound pretentious when I say it, but there are certain things that you identify that you relate to North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, just kind of, uh, it's hard to put your finger on it, but just kind of a, um, innocence isn't the right word, but a down homeness for lack of a better phrase. Yeah. Um, and I think that's well rooted. We are well rooted. I think that's what, uh, green and his family have. It reminds me a lot of Kobe White's family of Dayron mm-hmm. Sharp's family of Theo Pinson's family of the people around Reggie Bullock. Um, just kind of that feel and, and North Carolina, did well with Roy Williams with those kind of recruitments. And there, I think there's no doubt um, that um, they'll do well with Hubert Davis in, in this kind of recruitment. And the other thing to add on, and then I'll, I'll stop, is that Hubert Davis was his primary uh, recruiter as an assistant. 
Um, oh. So when you start to see how things kind of work out, you gotcha. know, maybe the, maybe the guys who Hubert Davis was a primary assistant on might have a leg up on some of the other guys who had an offer. So just throwing that out there too. No, that, that makes a ton of sense. And it's, it kind of follows an easy logic chain there. Sean, I, I want to kick to you for a little bit. I, I know that you've seen some of Green's tape. Uh, based on some of the things that Sherelle saw about, you know, some improved footwork and a little bit of better speed, how do you feel like that improves his game overall? And, and you know, knowing what you've seen is what his weaknesses are. Do you feel like it, that would that would kind of elevate him and make him a better fit at North Carolina? Or do you still feel like it's it's a pretty good fit anyway, but considering that he may be a project to some degree? No, I think what Sherelle said, that's, that's great to hear because the two, you know, main questions – two main questions about green coming in one just kind of his quickness his athletic ability his explosiveness kind of meshed together never really came off on the film that that you're watching uh you know you saw somebody that at 610 could you know could run up and down um you, you could shoot and you know i had a good release but the the quickness uh just never really came off so kind of hearing about either the improvement or just kind of seeing him in person is, is great to hear. Um, because I know for Green, he was, I think, one of the last offers that was made in that class. And at the time, even going back a handful of podcasts, uh, I think the question was, was he a UNC level or was he NC State level? Um, and I think if, if the quickness is improving, then I definitely think it's UNC level, especially given the height, uh, yeah. the height and the skill where you can, once again, uh, kind of play the five, you know, almost two positions basically. So um, still has a lot of time left to improve with the, the spring, summer and a full year. Um, and it sounds like as he continues to, to grow um, that his ceiling will grow with it. Um, so I think that's all positive and, and always good to get in-person evaluations after all the film that we've been you know watching really over the last 13 or so months well and hey that's uh you just dropped a quote on us too that'll absolutely be uh a great win for uh for listeners and that is a unc recruit and nc state recruit so kudos to you for playing the hits um hey want to give a, a special apology I, I forgot that i was using on my zoom for work and just happened to click us back into gallery mode. So forgive me for those of you who've been seeing this in speaker format on YouTube until now, forgive me for, for, uh, forgetting that, but I did make the change. So, you know, at least for the last little bit of this, you'll be able to see the, uh, the aforementioned gallery view as opposed to speaker view. All right, last thing. And this is where, um, I'm going to try to ask a question that I know is on a lot of UNC fan and inside Carolina subscribers minds. Uh, I want both of you guys to try to handle this as um, as honestly, but with uh, the soft um, band de soleil lotiony hands that might help get this message across without actually, you know, damaging anything or or being too cross. Because I'm I'm the guy that's usually the the harsh one around here. So, guys, everybody wants to know why UNC doesn't have a backup center yet. Uh, I think with Armando Baycott testing the draft, folks look at the roster and gosh knows it's been three days since somebody's committed, but uh, I think people are getting a little heartburn about not seeing a backup center on the roster. And the first thing I would say, hypothetically, if it were me, I would say, hey, guys, you all wanted more four out and one in offense. Well, we're recruiting four out and one in guys, we being UNC. Uh, am I am I stretching a little bit here, Sherelle? Is is this backup center need something that should have been filled yesterday, or would some patience actually pay off here for UNC fans and IC subscribers? Well, you know, I'm all about patience. So I have a four year old and a one year old. So patience is what I live daily. Uh, I no, assumed you were think... out of it at this point. But yes, go ahead. <laughs> now, I I think um, the answer is we don't know. Um, because we are assuming what we're assuming we know what Hubert Davis wants to do based upon some of the things he said publicly and pri privately and how he's recruiting, but we don't know. Um, so it could be a situation where they absolutely do want to back up five, but um, there are 1300 plus people in the portal. And if you're talking about, so let me go back in the high school ranks right now, there's no one who is considering UNC who fits the bill. 
you know, that, that I know of. There could be someone lower ranked, there could be someone yet to decommit or ask out of their letter of intent. So put the high school aside for now, because there doesn't seem to be anyone considering UNC, right? So then you talk about the portal, it's 1,300 people in there. Um, and the kind of person that you're talking about, a backup four or backup five, uh, Armando Baycott is poised if he returns to be a first team all ACC type player who's going to command a ton of minutes. Um, I know he can get into foul trouble and, and all that, but you're you're asking someone to come in and say, hey, you're you're a backup. Uh, you might play 10 minutes a game if, you know, Kellen's winning or if Armando gets in foul trouble, maybe you'll play 13. But after that, you know, that's probably where you're going to top out. Boy, so you make it sound all... so attractive, Sherelle. I can't <laughs> right, believe right. there aren't a thousand guys that want to play here now. <laughs> so so that is that is a hard sell. So um, that's one thing you have to say. Then two, again, we don't know how Hebert Davis wants to play. Maybe he is perfectly content with Brady Manick, Justin McCoy, and Armando Baycott as his three bigs. And that if Armando Baycott gets in foul trouble or injured or, or what have you, then Manick or McCoy is your, I don't even say starting center, you're just starting two fours. And then you have someone like Dontre Styles, who then becomes the third big mm -hmm. if Armando is hurt, and he, if he returns and he's hurt or he's in foul trouble or anything. So there is roster flexibility to be able to do that with what they have now. And so I think the math just is, is whatever, um, just a guy, he's not going to be a dude. If you're going to get him into the portal at this point, he's going to be a guy. Right. <laughs> is, is the guy that a you can warm get body. from the portal. <laughs> right, is the guy that you can get from the portal uh, at 13 minutes a game better than just rolling with McCoy, with Manic, and to some degree with Styles. So I think that's the math that they're trying to go after or trying to look at. But the honest answer is we just don't know because we don't know if he wants to have four bigs. Maybe he just maybe he wants another. Maybe he wants another <laughs> four. You know, we don't know. So I, I would urge to back to what you said. I would urge patience because um, this year players can enter the portal until July first. Uh, so you know, who's to say that perfect backup center? decide doesn't decide to enter the portal on June 15th well if you've already panicked and signed someone you know on April 17th then you can't get that guy obviously you're not waiting for you know, like the magic person to come but I think just prudence is probably key now because at worst you have depth at every position at worst you have three bigs whether or not they're a true five or a stretch four or whatever you have three bigs at worst um, at worst, you have your guards, you have your wings, you have your shooters, you're, you're good to go. So now I think you have to be patient because you're probably, I don't know if they're going to use both scholarships, but you're looking to add, you know, someone to do a special, very precise thing. And so you're going to take your time when you're looking for that. So I, I agree with you that patience is needed. Um, but we don't know if patience is needed because we don't know if they really want a backup five. That's something right. we're going to try and figure out, but we just don't know. I think it's important too, and and I probably should have done some some basic deconstruction math before we started this topic. Uh, there aren't but so many six ten and taller human beings walking on this earth. There are uh, so when you consider how many of those are now playing basketball, it's less. How many of those are in the transfer portal, it's less. And then when you start adding these extra search criteria you know, it's whittling that group down even more. So while there are 1,300 players in the portal as of right now, I think it's important for fans and, and IC subscribers um, to understand that there aren't 1,300 backup fives waiting in the portal. There are a small amount. And if you actually take a second, which I've done, and go through and look at who fit that bill, there's only a handful of them. And none of their stats jump off. It. Do you really want a guy from Southwest uh you know, Stone Creek University Tech College and hair drying school who averaged 2.3 points a game to come to UNC. Like, just because you want that body. I don't know that that answers the question. All that said, Sean, Sherelle touched on something I think you'd be great to elaborate on about how UNC might be able to massage who they have uh, to get through next season, even without a backup five. Well, one, I think, you know, Sherelle touched on pretty much every, everything, and I agree with him and, and you, Joey, as well. I, I think, once again, this this part is, let's assume Armando comes back. If he doesn't, then, you know, then I think this conversation is more apt. But if he does, then you, ha you have three guys, two that are very proven, and one that I think will be able to slot into uh, kind of a great 
first guy off the bench for, for big. So if you look at all of, and once again, we're also looking at Roy Williams teams. We don't know how, what, what's a Hubert team going to look like, but you look at all those teams and it's often been, they've had three successful bigs. So you bring one guy off the bench um, and you're able to just kind of rotate. Everybody's getting, getting minutes uh, and everybody for the most part is happy. I think last year we saw the issue where you have uh, not only four, four guy, you know, four, basically four players for one spot that were playing a little out of position. Um, but even the Notre Dame game where it was reduced to three, the flow just felt so much better uh, in terms of timing. And you have Armando Baycott who only averaged 24 minutes a game and was UNC's best player statistically. Uh, so I think, you want him playing 30 plus minutes if he's back. You want Manic playing 30 plus minutes uh, with his skill set. And then you want McCoy coming in. And he's, as we talked about last week, he spent his two years on the bench. He was starting to improve as a sophomore and he should be able to, you know, make a sophomore to junior, junior leap. Uh, so I think if you're adding a fourth guy, unless it's a freshman that has patience uh, and can contribute 5'10 foul trouble injury. You know, I'm probably fine rolling with three. Sherell mentioned uh, flexibility, roster flexibility. Styles um, also adds that as well. And when you look at Manic and Baycott, you really have two fives. Uh, Manic played the center last year, year before. Um, and while he's going to be outside shooting threes defensively, that's what he was playing the past past two years. So right now, if Armando comes back, I think it's a, a great fit uh, where you have the three that you know, the three that you know, and then you have styles to, to get some of that time as a freshman and, and give him, uh, you know, the opportunities to get better little by little. So all that being said, I, I love it as long as Armando comes back. Uh, if he doesn't, then, 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 yeah, then you definitely need another. That's another a hell of a big, caveat, but, brother. <laughs> um, you know, right, right now, how it slots, I think it's perfect. Shrill. And the, the only thing I would add, is that Sean said something. He was like, Armando Baycott should play 30 minutes a game. And then he said, Manic should play 30 minutes a game. And in my head, I'm like, 30 minutes? And the first thing I thought was, there's no way Roy Williams is going to play Armando Baycott 30 minutes a game. <laughs> and then, yeah. So I think what we're all going through and experiencing together is we're, even though we know that Hebrew Davis, you know, learned some stuff, learned the game from Roy Williams and Roy Williams recruited him. And there's the Coach Smith stuff and the Coach Guthrie stuff. I think we're still applying Roy Williams sensibilities and trying yeah. to apply that to what we think Hubert Davis is going to do. And the simple fact is right now we don't know and we won't know really until halfway through the season next year. Um, so I think everybody, us included, has to just change our mindset a little bit and be more open because when someone says something, we're like, well, that would never happen in Carolina because we're so used to how Roy Williams does it. I'm not yeah. saying that I know if Hubert Davis is going to go you know, completely on the opposite direction, or if it's going to be the same thing with a stretch big, I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think we all just have to be careful when we're applying those sensibilities because Hebrew Davis is the coach now and yeah. it could be completely different. It could be the same. It could be a mix. We, we just don't know. So um, that's, that's my advice to everyone um, is that like the backup five, like, of course, Roy Williams would want a backup five because that's how he played, but <laughs> we don't know if Hubert Davis is going to do that. So that, that's just my little, uh, I, I'll be, those would be my two pennies or my one penny that Sean, your one penny. All right, Sean, you got two pennies for us. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think just to add on to that, once again, uh, when you look at probably 80 to 90% of the teams are playing really with one big and, and now your four is what used to be a small forward. So if McCoy is playing the five, it's not the end of the world, uh, especially given his rebounding ability. Um, so I think that, you know, once again, Baylor had two bigs, uh, but for the most part, uh, most of the teams are going with, with one big. So I think even with that, it, it makes sense. Um, and I, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with, with Baycott. Hopefully he does come back because once again, he, you know, he made that freshman to sophomore year leap from a statistical standpoint, but was still getting, you know, 24 minutes. So I think we could definitely see that increase and you would you have a lot of experience uh combined with a lot of different skill sets uh for for next year so manic coming in is 
is great, and we'll be looking forward to him bombing threes next year. And, you know, I, this is all – this is what everybody wanted, right? Like, everybody wanted – uh, more spacing they wanted to play a more modern brand of basketball well if you can't have a more modern brand of basketball and then immediately lean right back into well, where's my two seven footers that need to play you know 25 minutes each a game like it just it, it doesn't work that way um but i digress i'll stop being the old crotchety guy hey look this has been great i appreciate you guys bringing the heat as always um i love that we touched on a bunch of different stuff tonight i hope this is enough to uh whet some of our subscribers appetites because i know the appetites out there and when news has been popping as quickly as it has um i see we've tried to do a great job of keeping up with it but uh hopefully we can give you some things to to tide you over for a little bit too like looking at not only commits but new offers and, and guys that are, have been on the unc radar and how they're improving and guys, I always appreciate uh, the levity and the wisdom that you bring to this here show. So if nobody else tells you, I'm telling you right now, before we put a bow on this, I appreciate Sherelle. I appreciate Sean because you're good enough. You're smart enough and doggone it. People like you. Um, that's going to do it for us this on uh, this episode of the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. I want to give a special shout out to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring the show, for John Siegley for producing and putting it all together, and for Sherelle McMillan and Sean Moran. I'm just Joey Powell. We appreciate you tuning in with us. Check us out next time and check out all of the Inside Carolina podcasts on InsideCarolina.com. We will talk at you down the road. Late.